today's presentation is is uh, about what we've affectionately called the giant shear box and working platforms. We'll go into much more detail and it'll make sense as we go through, but it's an initiative uh, carried out between the University, City University of London, um, between HS2 and, and um, SES Railways, to look at how we can uh, economize and drive efficiencies in working platforms on, um, on things like piling platforms and, and cranes and so on and so forth. My name is Jeff Mahoney. Like I said, I'm the lead um, head of temporary works for, for on um, SES on, on High Speed 2. Um, it's a three-way speaker event. And my colleague, uh, Stefano Quintavale, he's the deputy lead for D temporary works and design. I'm also joined by Professor Michael Davis from the City University of London. So I will lead, uh, Michael will take over and Stefano will, will also take uh, his section and I'll uh, close out the slides. So in relation to <clears throat> the Giant Shear Box Initiative and, and the programme, it, it, began, it began what we is effectively known as phase one, which was the, it was an initial approach to better understand the performance of granular materials on working platforms for cranes, piling rigs, etc. And it was carried out by a, a doctorate student called uh, by the name of Greta Tangetti and, and this, uh, in collaboration with City University of London. Now, the research was sponsored by the Temporary Works Forum. Um, for those of you in Ireland, the Temporary Works Forum is, is an organization here that drives best practice and, and guidance in temporary works in, in the UK industry. The Wentworth House and Partnership, you can see here, obviously, the City University of London is represented. Wentworth House and Partnership is, is a design organisation. Um, they are well known in the industry for developing temporary works design solutions. And they were involved in actually designing the giant shear box, which you will see itself. The main objective of the research in phase one um, was to develop a testing method to derive the shear strength parameters of large particle size materials in that we typically use in working platforms. So your 6F5s, your 6F2s and so on and so forth, traditionally used in working platforms. So principles and findings when they carried out phase one, um, Again, what, what led to this phase one was there was a, a significant level of incidence of overturning plant across the industry, which which unfortunately uh, you know, becomes the norm. Um, and there was what's led to very thick and over-designed engineering working platforms and a conservative, uneconomical approach to, the, to their designs. The design is often based on the use of bearing capacity methods, which allow us to calculate the thickness of working platforms, depending on the characteristics of the platform material and the subgrade. Among these factors, the one having the most influence is the angle of friction between the material uh, on, on the likes of the 6F5s and the 6F2s. A series of tests were conducted in this phase one of crushed limestone of on material aggregate up to 20 millimeters using a large shear box. The, um, there was um, a, a standard shear box was also used, but again, they're very limited in, in the material sizes that they can use. However, the scales that they were using for these shear boxes, the large and the standard, there was scalability was demonstrated, meaning that they were, they were uh, linked to each other with regards to results. Here you can see an image of what is considered a large shear box. And the plan view, the typical plan view of such shear boxes is 300 by 300 mil. But one of the constraints in this is that it's restricted to uh, materials up to 20 millimeters. So aggregates larger than that have to be removed from a test sample. If you're to this, how this is correlated on a size distribution graph, you can see that the rectangular, uh, the purple rectangle 
um, where it indicates that the material is removed from 20 mil and upwards for, for a particle, for a material called 6F5. Again, this 6F5 is what's traditionally used in the industry across the UK for building working platforms. It's, it's cheap material. Um, but the large shear box, if you're testing 6F5, you're going to have to remove material of 20 mil and higher. And there is, in certain instances, you could be re removing up to 70% of the material, of 6F5 material from the test sample. So it, it effectively renders large shear boxes useless when it comes to being effective at testing the sample material itself. What are they going to do? How do we tackle this? The giant shear box is born, again, designed by Wentworth House. And this is how it sits down in the City University of London. And in comparison to the large shear box, which is 300 by 300, this is 1.5 meters by 1.5 meters on average in, in, in size. So you can see the scalability difference. Uh, it became known to us um, that phase one was going on and they had the, res and Sarah, uh, Greta Tangetti had completed her our paper and we decided that on our project that it was time to carry out a series of site trials to capture the real life scenarios of a contractor importing 6F5 into a site for working platforms and actually test that material. Now the suppliers we used were traditional suppliers as well and they were not informed that we were testing this material we just ordered it in as we would be uh, for a traditional working platform, piling rigs, cranes, so on and so forth. So again, the emphasis was on site trials in a real life scenario. How is this material going to, to stack up against what the type of material was being tested in phase one? The sites, the trials themselves commenced in February of last year. And they concluded in June, and there was uh, 19 tests in total, and um, and the the results of which were you you will see from from my my two colleagues. I'll hand you over to now to Professor Michael Davis, and he'll go into a bit more detail about uh, the processes and and what happened at the university itself. Excellent. Well, um, good evening, everybody. And it's a great, great pleasure to be here, especially as I'm a Welshman, not an Englishman. So it's nice to be with uh, my Celtic colleagues. So um, uh, it's great to see you all. And, and indeed, uh, those I can't see in, in Ireland, it's nice to be with you. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the, the work we actually did at City. The box, um, was, 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 if you heard, was used by Greta. She was working on certain type of material. We had to so far fine tune it for the new material. Um, but I'm going to take you through um, how we actually conducted the test. Um, I just start by saying this is, it's not just a very big shear box. It's the biggest in the world. No one's ever built one quite this big of this, this type. So, um, so it really is a unique piece of apparatus. Uh, and so it's a, it is a, uh, this is the first time this sort of work's ever been done. So it's quite exciting for, from an academic point of view, as much as for the, for the industrial side of things as well. So let's look at the material we're testing. We, um, we tested three types of material from three different sources. Um, to, to avoid blushes or anything else, we're just going to call the materials M1, M2 and M3. But M1 was our, um, was our, our least level of control and M3 was our greatest level of control. But you can sort of see the type of material that we're dealing with here. Um, um, and we could take particle size up to 150 millimetres in the shear box. For the, to, to, be, to be within norms of size of shear box. And you can see it contains um, as you would expect for this sort of type of recycled material, bricks and concrete and foam, and, and you'll see some interesting other things later on in the talk. But, the, but basically, it's, it's a very, very heterogeneous material, which goes back to Jeff's point a few moments ago, that if you were just to screen off the, 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 the larger stuff, you'd miss most of the stuff that's in there. You just end up with the, sort of the, 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 the crumbs and the lie on the bottom of the, of, of the container. So really, you had to test the full material in order to get its, 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 its sheer strength. 
The, as we move from there from sort of the, the most heterogeneous material to what we call M2, which is sort of a slightly higher level of control, a medium level of control, you can see this, there, are, there, are, there, are, there is a, a, a lot of uh, a brick still in there, but things are slight, slightly um, more homogenized, um, as, as you, could, you, you could say, but the material size is a bit slightly more homogenized, but still it's, it's a fairly heterogeneous material when, and which, and when you look at it, and we'll, I'll show you some data from that um, towards the end of my, my, my part. Of the presentation, and finally, this is our this is our Rolls Royce of material, our primary aggregate material. Still, um, it's, it's still the, the 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 same same the same specification as we saw before, but actually a lot more primary material in it. There's, there are still waste materials in it, but still, it's it, it's the, the proportion of primary material is, uh, um, is 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 much more in this material. So here's the, the giant shear box, as, we, as, we, as we've been told. It's the horizontal plane is, is one and a half meters square and, and, and sample heights uh, about a meter, just over a meter. So, so the, um, as you can see, it, the, I'll show you how it works in a moment, but basically we have various components to this. Um, there's sort of a, a top beam, which actually restrains, the whole thing's in its own self-stressing frame. The top beam retains that the, 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 uh, the jack at the top and um, that's that's uh, uh, the vertical jacks are 500 ton jacks to give you a feel for the the sort of forces that we're dealing with. There's a 500 ton jack. The um, the shear box um, that's the, the two is in two halves, the top half and the lower half. The top half, um, and then storage bags. You bring the stuff in, material in. Um, typically, bags were about 800 kilograms, something like that, and we put about five into the shear box. So each each sample, I've never worked with such big samples before. Each sample weighs about four tons. So just give you an idea of the of, of the size we're dealing with. Um, the horizontal jacks at the back, they are obviously are tuned, they're four at the back to stop, stop, stop ro ro rotating, and they, they give the equivalent to the top. In fact, they're 400 tons rather than 500, they're four 100 ton jacks. And there's the bottom half of the shear box, which moves. There's the, the, the bottom, the, you keep the top half just like a normal shear box. Those of you who are in, 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 in our geotechnical people, you keep the top part of the box um, restrained and held by load cells, and you push the bottom part of the box underneath to make it to shear the material. Um, and then the, those are load cells which we, you know, measure the, the, for, the, the, the shear force and restrain the upper part of the box. And, and then that's all data, logged onto a data logger. But we have, we're measuring. The force, the, the normal force, the horizontal force, the displacement to the bottom of the box, and actually the, the heave um, or settlement of the top cap in order that we can actually work out if it's dilating or compressing, exactly the same as you would with a small sample. And moving on to the preparation, the way we do it is to take the lower half, take the top of the half of the box off, put the lower, put the lower part in, put the put material in the lower half using these these uh, these bags um, brought from site. Um, it's compacted in layers. I'll show that in a moment. In the lower half, we put um, two and a half, two two layers in the bottom. Put the top on. A third layer goes, so we don't have a a, 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 a joint, if you like, from the different layers of material with the lining with the shear plane. Then there's two more go on the top. And you can sort of get a, a sense for the, the the scale. Now I might point out that the, the, the gentleman on the right hand side is Sam Deval, who is the academic responsible for this work. I, I'm just a hanger on in this particular thing. So Sam is Sam is the, is the, is, the, is the leading light in this, um, and he's done a lot. There you, know, you can see he's getting his hand dirty. I just boy wave my arms around. Um, then the you can sort of see the uh, this is the lower, upper half coming on, materials going in, being leveled, and then compacted. Um, using using a wacker plate, so it's just compacted inside the box. First time I've ever done an experiment where I've had to use a wacker plate to compact my sample, but basically use a wacker plate, and then the top, and then the then the top cap is put on after that. We can take quite large samples, but we can't take every large particle. These are particles which we took out of um, of the material we're testing. Give you an idea. These are ones that have got through the screening, probably because they're they're they're, they're linear in nature. They've actually popped down through the screens, and you can sort of see concrete blocks. And the one on the right is actually two put together, um, with a little bit of rebar in there. We th if that had been across the shear plane, we'd have had reinforced earth. We were we were mod modeling not just uh, not just not just shear plane. So this is some of the challenges you normally get in a, in a soil mechanics laboratory of removing these large lumps of material. So we took we did take those out of the um, um, of, of of the material. 
This shows the, the box. Um, on the left-hand side, that's the box before the start of a test. The, 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 the dotted line um, on the on the left-hand side shows you where, where, the, where the, the test, where the material starts. Then at the, the oh, oh, I keep me come back. <laughs> um, the, 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 on the right-hand side, you can see where the box actually moves across. There's actually a mistake on that slide. It's okay here. Mm -hmm. There's a mistake on that. It's actually 300 millimeters. It moves, not 200 millimeters. So the lower half can move 300 millimeters um, um, to, uh, to, during, during the test. Um, we also monitor, as you can see in the center, the, the, uh, just the lifting of the, of the box, the two halves of the box. Um, they're, there's, they're lubricated, but they, they you find that due to this complementary shear, the, the top just lifts slightly off, which is good because it reduces friction forces. Um, but we, we monitor that as well as monitoring using LBDTs, the actual the top cap which, of, the, of, the, uh, of the box. As I just pointed out here, as you see in the right hand side, um, before we start a test, all tests are taken up to an, a, a normal stress at the top of 500 kilopascals. Um, that's the maximum stress that we did in any test, and that's what's recommended in the various codes. So we put 500 kilopascals, basically to compact the soil to all the samples. Although, they, although they've been compacted in the soil, we compress it using 500 kilopascals. That's uh, it for, in terms of the force in the jack, is 1,125 kilonewtons. So it's uh, so or 112, 100. 12.5 tons. So there's a lot, there's a lot of force goes on the top. Everything creaks when you put it on. <laughs> um, so that goes on the top before we start. So we do that. Then we um then we decrease the vertical stress to the test with any, as I said, any shear box, the test to the test value. Um, and then we and then we apply the the lateral jacks to actually shear to shear the box. So it's fill, compress, um, shear, exactly the same as any any any, any other sample you're testing. This is uh, after a test. Um, the uh, take taken apart. With the, it's lifted out. Take lift the top off. That shows you the material which is being compressed um, inside um, inside there. Um, and then we were very fortunate, um, due due to our, our sponsors, to get a uh, hold of a of, a, of an, an electric um, digger. So I think this is the only one in the country at the time, Jeff. I think we, we, we yeah, about one or two. So so was it? It's, Great, um, the great, great driver, electric digger, so we could actually in the lab, we could then dig everything out of the, of the. Uh, other, otherwise, when we did the work with with Greta, um, we had to sort of find burly master students who could be persuaded to go digging there. So it's quite nice to have a a machine and and a very very good uh, operator to 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 do it as well. It's quite delicate. It may not look like delicate work, but compared to being on site, it's delicate. Just to give you an idea of the material, um, this, this shows you the constituents. This, 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 this was actually um, done on site, um, not by us, it was done by SCS Railways and the various, various, various people involved there. Was it Cost Danger did this? I can't remember, was that people, Jeff? Um, and basically looking at it, and I, I apologies for those of you who are, um, what, what can't, they can't see, but basically what's shown here are the constituents. So on the left hand, you've got RC is, is, is concrete, concrete products. Um, RU is unbound aggregates. And then the sort of primary material um, is, is, is this, uh, um, sorry, this RB is masonry units, and R and R um, A is vitreous materials. You can see the material. There's a lot of there's a lot of masonry in there. There's a lot of concrete in there. Um, this is our M2 material. So it gives you an idea of what we were testing, and we've done this for all. And on the right hand side, then you can see the the grading curve for this material, um, which fits in with the Department of Transport grading. Um, spec that, uh, that that Jeff showed in his slide, which shows the the um, the maximum minimum. So the six, it's actually mid mid spec, but it's it's a, but it is but it very about varies in there. So having done the tests, you measure the force, then we reduce the data, and we can come up then with a whole series of points where we've measured we measured the, the shear stress and, and the vertical effect of stress. Um, during during the test, don't forget the area is changing. So the vertical effect of stress changes during the course of the test; it increases. And so we can plot the individual tests in here as you would not normally. And from that, we can get an angle of friction. And um, and so um, this for this particular uh, material, um, we've got an angle um, of, of about four to six degrees. I think it was, but one point one point. Um, um, uh, so ooh, this is not very really happy screen. <laughs> um, uh, of about. Uh, 46 degrees. Um, and so 
Um, this is a certain amount of spread, and with different materials, we had greater spread. I'm going to show you results for one today. This is our middle one. The I just res the, the the M1 um, had had more more data, data spread, and M3 had a lot a lot less. But what we did do was look at um, the 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 basically the uh, the confidence levels, and so we put on here the 90 percent confidence level. So so the so, sorry the average is 47.6 plus or minus two degrees. So if we're looking at 90% confident level for your design, um, it would go down to about four to five degrees for your for your design in there. And I think that brings me on to Stefano. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stefano Quintavalle. I uh, work for Skanska and I'm currently the lead temporary world design manager for SES Railway. So as the tests were carried out on the 6 of 5 material at the London City University, internally in the project, we started to review our designs related to working platforms. We went back to March 2021 when phase two of the project started and we collected area and volume of all the working platforms uh, that we installed so far in SES with the aim that we want to see what could have been the possible saving relating to the introduction of a material with better geotechnical parameters. During this exercise, we also compare the working platform thickness in one specific um, working platform, our case um, study. And we want to see which was the most efficient design method. So we just pick up uh, a medium size binary rig that we used um, on site. Um, the operating weight was um, 98 ton. And in this case, the working platform had to cover both a London, a London clay um, subgrade. You can see in the screen a fine, cohesive subgrade with an undrained shear strength of uh, 50 kilonewton per square meter. And, um, and also, we had to cover in another area of the site. Um, a subgrade that was um, coarse subgrade, a granular subgrade, and we assume uh, a moderately conservative value of 34 degrees. So this is not the typical uh, made ground value, but in the side there were an area where some um, recycled material had been previously um, installed, and we were not sure about the compaction of the lower strata. So we went with a conservative value of um, 34 degrees. Um, the water table was to a depth that we considered to not to have any um, influence in the design. And when we had to uh, choose what was the um, moder a moderately conservative value for um, a working platform angle of friction, we start to consider that the material that we specify in the project is usually 6 of 5, so it's engineering feel uh, that is well graded. Um, we always always keep in on, on site in the project um, records of the installation ITP and the working platform in SES are regularly inspected by a strict permit to load system. We also carry out site tests to verify our design assumption and in this case we also carry out sieve test, a lake coefficient test, um, shear vein test for cohesive subgrade plate bearing test for granular subgrade and also on top of the um, working platform. So we believe that it is safe to assume a moder moderately conservative parameter of 45 degrees for the um, working platform angle of friction. So we consider also a unit weight of 20 uh, kilonewton uh, per cubic meter and we start with our comparison. So the majority of the designs in our project were carried out with um, the BRE method. But for this specific case, we also ran a comparison with the temporary work photo method. So both design methods have pro and cons. And the aim of this presentation is not to discuss what is the best or the most appropriate method. Um, for the people in the room that are not familiar with these design uh, approaches, the BRE method is a semi-empirical method that uses the measure of bearing capacity the formula, considering a punching shear mechanism within the platform. The design uh, method works, though, only for a unique strata, a unique subgrade layer. 
and also has another limitation. It is confined to a certain undrained shear strength uh, for cohesive material, and these, um, the limit is between 20 and 80 kilonewton per square meter. Um, the temporary work forum method is a method that is fully compliant with the Euro code and consider a maximum uh, spreading angle beta of 26.6 uh, degree. And um, is, we consider also active and passive contribution uh, to the platform. As I said before, uh, both methods have pros and cons. The temporary work forum method, uh, for example, is fully compliant with the Euro code. Uh, it can be used um, with different strata, but it might be more laborious than, than the BRE method. As you can see in this slide, we start with an uh, angle of internal friction of 45 degrees. Um, the BRE method was more conservative. We had a thickness of 950 millimeter. Uh, the temporary work forum method um, had a thickness of um, 800. And after we start to change the angle of internal friction and see how um, the thickness of the working platform was varying. If you look online, you might find similar trials, but, and I'm sure that all the temporary work designers that are in, in the room today, um, they are well aware, aware of how sensitive um, is the design of uh, the thickness of a working platform, even with a small change in the angle of friction. <clears throat> so this is just an example to show to the audience uh, that is not familiar with the design, the massive variation in um, the working platform thickness. So if we go with a lower angle of friction, you can see that the BRE method requires 1.3 meter thick platform against 950 uh, of the temporary work forum. But if we go to the spectrum, to, to the vector spectrum of the material towards the, uh, an angle of friction of 50, the temporary work forum method requires a thickness of 750 against um, 650 of the um, BRE method. We also run a comparison doing um, a design using a FEM analysis software. Uh, we vary the angle of friction for the granular platform as we did for the previous slide and we consider a model of elasticity of 25 for the cohesive and the granular subgrade. As required by um, the Eurocode 7, we work out what is the maximum settlement under the load applied by the piling rig. In this case, <clears throat> we will assess the, the two most onerous cases, the standing and the extracting cases. So we had a settlement of 12 millimeter on the left track when the rig was uh, standing and after a settlement of 32 millimeter uh, on the left track when the rig was extracting. We work out what is the absolute settlement. So the absolute settlement on the left track, the difference between the two operations is 20 millimeter, which is within the maximum uh, allowable 50 millimeter. And, and also we cross check the, the maximum differential settlement, which is 1.7 millimeter per linear meter, which is less than five millimeter. The 50 is coming from the Eurocode and on site, we want to squeeze that down to a lower value. We plot in this um, slide, the analysis that we did with the Eurocode 7 and is the continuous green line. So with the FAM software, we run an analysis uh, using the Eurocode 7 design uh, approach one, combination two, and um, we apply a partial uh, factor on the loads of 1.3. And we also run another analysis, which is the dash line at the bottom, uh, lowering down um, the partial uh, action, the, the partial factor of safety on action from 1.3 to one. Uh, that is due to close um, 2.4.7.1 and is pretty much in line with the temporary work forum method that is considering that when, um, when the rig is operating, um, basically the driver has the opportunity to recover the power. So on, on that case, you can see that the required thickness is not very different for a file that is 50, but there is still quite a substantial difference between uh, the four value when a fire is um, around 45. So the M2 material gave us a 90% confidence that for an angle of internal friction of 46.7 degrees, plus or minus two degrees. So potentially we are 
leaning towards the 650 thickness of the working platform. So as, as I just mentioned in the project, the majority of the working platform design were carried out using the BRE method. Uh, comparing the initial design with a phi of 45 degrees with a phi of 50, it shows us a saving of 31% of the material. So considering that so far, we stole 190,000 cubic meter of 6 or 5. And if we consider a 31% saving, we could have saved 59,000 cubic meter of material, which equates to 17 Olympic size swimming pools and more than 11,000 truck movements removed from the road. In terms of CO2 emission, this equates to uh, more than uh, 1,500 flights from London mm -hmm. to New York, 914 tons of CO2, and 1.3 million just related to material saving without considering um, the installation, labor, labor and plant and, 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 and other costs that are related with working platform installation. This is possible, though, as long as the amount of waste and fine material on the recycle six or five is minimized. So the result from the M2 material, as um, we saw before, showed that we could rely with a 90% confidence on, on, an, on an angle of shear resistance of 47.6 plus or minus two degree. So how do we make sure that we are closer to the 50 degrees and, and we get the most from a recycled six or five material. So this is the material M2 that Professor Davis showed before. As you can see, we have some bricks, fabric, breeze blocks, stone, general waste, timber, paving slab, an electric cable, some plastic and a car key fob. So this is the chart that Professor Davis showed early. So if we were to implement a high level of control in the material, making sure that the six or five is well graded, quantities of fine are minimized, and we reduce the amount of waste in the material coming to site, we could potentially be in this situation, we just remove the bad spot and we could be with high control, we could be considering that chart where we have an angle of friction at this 49.7, so we are very close to 50. So looking at the size of our project is very easy to do the math, as a higher angle of friction uh, could lead to a saving of over 1 million. But with this research, we would like to set up the basis to empower both the contractor and the designer to make the right decision on the geotechnical parameters to assume uh, for working platform design from a safety, environmental, program, and cost uh, point of view. We believe it is the time for the industry to recognize that it is possible to assume a higher angle of friction as long as good quality material is imported on site and strict quality control and tests are implemented. But at the same time, though, we believe that it is not always commercially justified uh, to produce certain type of material, carry out ext extensive site tests and have a FEM software uh, to work out thickness of a working platform, especially for the routine design of working platform in small sites. Jeff will give you more details in the next slide as we are working to revise the existing temporary work forum guidance um, related to working platform. So the aim basically is to establish the requirements for the contractor and the designers to make a controlled decision on what, what is the possible angle of internal friction that can be assumed in the design based on the type of material, quality control, and um, uh, tests. For example, the table in, in this slide has been extracted from the temporary work forum guide. Um, at the moment, we are discussing with the working group on how we would like to enhance the current guidance by adding more specific re requirements in terms of quality, inspection, and maintenance. Um, this will enable the contractor and the designer to make a safe assumption on the angle of internal friction and uh, the design brief for the working platform when it's prepared. 
Um, just a, a few closing slides on, on where we are now. So the throughout the the the, the trial the side trials that we've been partaking in over the last 12 months or so, we have been engaging with um with, with forums and entities to get uh, this information out to the industry because at the end of the day you know all this work be it uh, as good as it is it's only as good as uh, what a designer can hang their hat on and and they're only going to be able to hang their hat on something that they can relate to formally in in the form of of a standard or guidance so when we presented what we were up to with the temporary works forum um they saw the the um the importance of what we were doing and what, what, we, what it was yielding. And they decided that they had an existing uh, set of guidance on, on working platforms, brand new working platforms, which was published back in April 2019. And that with the knowledge we have now from the work we carried out with the City University of London, that it was time to, to look at that guidance again and, and, and see where we can enhance it. The existing guidance itself, the 2019 guidance, it is comprehensive, it is well structured, um, but there's 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 things we can see that we can enhance within it. It's heavy on design, um, and we can we can see we're going to see where we can strengthen the bond between the temporary works coordinator, site based person, and the designer and the construction team. We are also looking at at enhancing our um, uh, developing um, more specifics in relation to the roles related to managing these working platforms, design itself, the soils and, and other materials linked to, to, uh, to the designs, the software itself. So we know more about FEM analysis and what that, um, what that yields in relation to the traditional methods uh, like the BRE and the Temporary Works Forum methods. And also to enhance testing and proving out on site. Um, the construction teams need more guidance in relation to how they take care of working platforms out on site. Because at the end of the day, it's one of the things that drives uh, conservative behavior in designers uh, because they have lack of confidence in the construction teams and how serious they treat um, and how well they treat their working platforms they don't necessarily always consider them a piece of uh, structure that, that has to hold up. What you see from piling rig is, is a very top heavy piece of kit and, and can overturn very, very easily with very little persuasion. The <clears throat> other elements we're looking to enhance or improve within the current guidance is uh, good examples of design briefs um designers risk assessments um which you know aren't always necessarily required under under cdm specific design risk assessments but we've seen the value of those in 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 our in our project um drawings as well temporary works permits good examples of those uh, what you wouldn't traditionally use in temporary works are things like inspection and tech test plans which support a temporary works permit as evidence and helps to, to draw the attention of the construction team as to the, the, the importance of the construction of these platforms at different levels. Uh, and also plenty of best, best uh, practice uh, worked examples um, for the end user to read, absorb, and appreciate uh, when they're carrying out their roles. So <clears throat> with that, the with our works with, with the Temporary Works Forum and, and their agreement to create a working group um, to uh, revise the, the guidance, the 2019 guidance. We started working group um, 05 and uh, we're chairing that at the moment at SCS. Our first meeting was in, in November of last year. We had a second one in December with the next one in February, um, in February the 7th. Uh, we have been very lucky, very fortunate uh, with our partners, HS2, who have uh, significantly part funded this initiative all the way through. And they've also uh, offered support from uh, 
from an administrative point of view to see out this the working group and help accelerate their uh, their their good work and and, and get an accelerator program on on publishing the guidance um we are hoping with that with that support we are hoping that the working groups um will finalize all the enhancements and the revisions uh, ready for review probably hoping around may of this year with a view to publishing formally then towards the end of the year and that is that is fast that is uh, that is that is quick when it comes to these working groups because at the end of the day we're all volunteers to this group there's a collection of experts throughout the industry throughout the UK and actually beyond the UK that are involved in these groups so it takes a considerable amount of effort to to get all those thoughts and that that those opinions and and uh, on in paper and and people pulling together it's an ideal opportunity for people to have different opinions and you will get the odd argument but that's the you know, working groups are a place to have those and have that debate because what you want to publish is something that's already been tested before it's published by professionals and with that i'll um i again i want to thank professional uh, professor michael davis and and stefano quintavalle for for joining me here and again, I want to say a huge thanks to um, all the three entities within the joint venture, the City University of London and, and, and HS2. Um, it, is, it has been a significant team effort to get as far as we are. And, and I do see that once we have this guidance published, the industry can use it. Again, like I said, hang their hat on it. And, and we can see uh, more uh, care and attention carried out on site. Uh, leading to a less conservative approach from a design point of view. And like uh, Stefano alluded to, you know, the savings, the, the savings that come with that approach are huge uh, from directly from a money point of view, but also the, the, uh, the added effects of uh, benefits of taking trucks off the road, less dust in the site um, and, um, and the carbon element as well. So with that, I will start taking questions. Um, so the first one here, um, the question is related to the advantages of the BRE470 and the, bill and the ability to input parameters relating to geogrids, reducing the platform thickness. Um, so off topic and more appropriate to the temporary works firm, uh, will the temporary works firm look into introducing geogrid parameters to further reduce platform thicknesses and can the city university mm -hmm. set up be used to test geogrid arrangements take the second part so the the first part is obviously uh, it can't be underestimated uh, the level the logistics the logistical challenge involved in getting bags of material from Houston down to the university um, it, it is more difficult than you would ever imagine. And, and we did have a certain scope. We did have a certain amount of finance to carry out that. And, 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 and you know, we, we did have 19 uh, tests that were carried out on material. And our initial approach was on granular material, 6F5, recycled 6F5. And obviously M3 was the... the um, uh, the, the likes of the material that's generated and made within the quarry. But our focus is on 6F5 that's recycled because uh, typically, certainly in London, that's what's typically used. Um, in relation to in relation to geogrids, obviously our test didn't extend into that because we had a time frame, we had budgets, but that's not preventing uh, further tests from being from including geo that's okay. going forward uh, yeah, can I say something? Yeah. yeah the in fact since we've gone public on this there's been a huge amount of interest about texting testing geogrids in the box um we've got a design in order to incorporate geogrids you would guess um but um it but the you know but the logistics of doing those sort of tests is very high you can't just say to an undergraduate do a couple of tests for us it just doesn't happen so we you know so we are looking to raise funding for that particular area 
maybe from you guys, but but, but I know you. But we've already probably probably milked you dry already. <laughs> but but other sources as well. I know that people, you know, pe people, some of the uh, the big ge ge grid manu manufacturers and um, and consultants, as you probably know their names, <laughs> have been have been talking to us and we're hoping that we can perhaps put together something to um, to use this unique apparatus to to, to in a, in a way where we can actually look at interface between you know, large large particle materials and and geogrids. I think it's a really it's it's be a great thing we could do it. It's something we want to do, but we have to you know be be realistic about the timescales and funding yeah. that sort of thing. But yes, great 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 question. And uh, on that, actually, in relation to the working group itself, um, Tensar who are um, league leaders in the across the world in in relation to geogrids, they are heavily represented within the working group itself. So it will feature the use of geogrids will feature in the next revision of that guidance. Uh, but from a testing point of view, obviously, that's that's another phase. Uh, another question uh, regarding the, the giant shear box, uh, and basically, is it available to other entities for use? <laughs> that's definitely for you, my goodness. <laughs> simple answer, <clears throat> yes. Um, the less simple answer is please come have a chat with us about the costing. Yeah, very happy to do that. <laughs> Somebody from the room? Anybody? Don? Jeff, yeah, I was just wondering what was the cost of the testing because the savings were vast. So um, I suppose the end, I'm at liberty to say <laughs> that. Um, the the cost for the testing were between 40 and 50,000. Um, there was design work, but there was a certain design element was involved in that in the case studies. But um, HS2 would have would have helped fund a lot of that. And a lot of the labor and plant then would have been donated by SES. And, and, and that's how it worked. But again, in relation to the savings, you can see what, what the benefits could well be worked. that investment here. Yeah. Anyone else? Next question. Uh, Sorry. Uh, given the, the sort of savings or the, the potential benefits you've got back from doing the test, uh, this might be a, a bit of a cheeky question, but why hasn't anyone done it before? Well, the giant shear box. The giant shear box. Yeah. Existence it, it, it didn't exist before, really. It's, it's, um, it's, 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 the big, I said the biggest of its type. I did once build a larger shear box actually, uh, when I was a lecturer at Cardiff many years ago, um, for testing soil nails. It was had the same shear plane, but it was and it was actually two meters long, but it was actually horizontal, so you could do that with shear. We, we put a soil nail in that way. You've got two meters long length, and so you haven't got the same boundary conditions. So I actually built and built that and did a whole pile of testing with soil nails. Um, so, um, but that. As, um, as soon as I left it to go elsewhere, it was dismantled because nobody else was using it. So, uh, um, and small, the slightly smaller ones, there's one in Spain about, it's about, um, about a meter, um, no, 75 centimeters. And there's one in um, in Newcastle, Australia, which is about one meter. So there are, but this is, but nobody's ever built one quite, maybe nobody's been mad enough to build one quite this big before. But, uh, but you know, but it's, it's, it's been driven by the size of the particles. If you, if you want to test something which is you know, up to 125 mil, which is the, you know, the, the top at range, you've got to have something which is at least a meter, meter deep. Um, and um, and 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 and, uh, and 1.5 meters in, um, across. That's, that's, yeah. That fits in. Alex, you mentioned yeah. different sizes for the different um, particles. How did you come up with that ratio? What the right size? Yeah, yeah there, there are a lot of testing has been done over the years and everything from sort of 50 millimeter up to 300 millimeter shear boxes, looking at particle size um, and, 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 and the results, making sure that they, 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 they actually agree with each other, like a modeling of models, if you like. So there's been a lot of work done. Of course, we're extending it from, from right a long way, but basically, yeah, it's, uh, it's because of, sort of the, the particle have enough move. They, they, they can move without being... Uh, over affected by the boundaries it's, it's a really that's the important thing Anybody? is there is there an optimum size for the shear box so i just said uh, just to confirm the question is is there an optimum size to the shear box um if for, for the material you're using yes this is the optimum size for 125 millimeter material if you wanted to put bigger stuff in you'd have to go bigger yeah so yeah so you could basically this, this we're putting the largest type of material in that we possibly can in this shear box the scale is is a 10 to 15 yes uh, 10, 10 to 15, 15 ratio, ratio. Yeah. <clears throat> so anybody else peter in the back i did a lot of work on fine back in the back 
30 years ago with some station piling and the Federation of Piling Specialists, which eventually made its way into the BRE 470. And I've always been shocked of the results that we got out of BR uh, 470, uh, because historically we, we were always achieving a lot better platforms uh, sort of 30 years ago, primarily because we had things like uh, spent railway ballast and clean cracked concrete, which is probably similar to what you're calling your M3. So our, while, whilst we can never prove that we had a, a change of uh, 50 degrees or 60 degrees even, uh, very often we do calculations we would assume that. So my personal experience, one of the big failings that we do as an industry, we don't consider A, the material we're uh, placing uh, for the location, and, and also how we look at the drainage. It's the water within the platform yeah. that will deteriorate extremely quickly. And that's 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 an interesting point. So the the point is made about drainage and and how platforms behave when they're saturated. The one of the things that we discovered when we were going from the M1 material, which was from <clears throat> supplier A, to the M2 material, which was from supplier B, both six F five recycled material, but with the second supplier, we we stipulated a a minimum fines content, uh, sorry, maximum fine content of fifteen percent. And that is is that is uh, uh, significant in relation to uh, how we were getting the the strengths were higher, but also we know that the free draining capacity is going to be much improved uh, with that that maximum uh, fines. Again, something we've been prescribing, and uh, we know to to heavily include in in the guidance. Yeah, 